today we come to vipassana meditation so please note that the word vipassana means seeing in various ways and seeing in various ways means seeing mind and matter or the five aggregates or the conditioned phenomena as impermanent suffering and on self now the manual at the beginning of this section gives us the names of the seven stages of purity so when we practice vipassana meditation we go through these seven stages of purity one after another and they are given as a chart on page 3 Four, five. So the first is the purification of virtue, purification of sila. It will be explained later. So the purification of sila are four kinds of purified virtue. That is for monks. And then second purity is purification of mind. Purification of mind. really means purification of concentration the word mind here is used to represent concentration so excess concentration and absorption concentration are uh, said to be or said to constitute purification of mind and then third is purification of view Purification of view means understanding characteristics etc of mental and physical phenomena. First defining mind and matter and then understanding their characteristics function mode of manifestation and proximate causes. And fourth is purification by overcoming doubt purification of overcoming doubt and that is discernment of conditions for mental and material phenomena so at this stage a yogi sees the conditions or causes for mental and physical phenomena and fifth is purification by knowledge and vision of path and not path that means the right way and the wrong way so it consists of knowledge of comprehension knowledge of rise and fall tender phase now knowledge of rise and fall has two phases so the first is called tender phase or it is called yang vipassana and distinguishing wrong path from right path of contemplation during this stage of or between the two stages of tender phase and mature phase the distinguishing wrong path from right path of contemplation or cause and then sixth is purification by knowledge and vision of the way and it consists of knowledge of rise and fall mature phase and then knowledge of dissolution of fearfulness of danger of disenchantment of desire for deliverance of reflection of equanimity towards formations and knowledge of conformity and between 6 and 7 between 6 purification and 7 purification there is change of lineage so change of lineage is not included in the 6 or in the 7th so it is out of both 6 and 7 and then there is the last one seventh purity purification by knowledge and vision that is knowledge of four supramundane paths that means attainment of enlightenment so a yogi goes through these seven stages of purity to reach enlightenment and they are to be attained in sequence so you cannot skip any one of these purities and these purities will be explained in some detail later so next 
the three characteristics are given and they are characteristic of impermanence, characteristic of suffering and characteristic of non-self. Now characteristic means mark, mark of impermanence, mark of suffering, mark of non-self. So when we see the mark, we know something is impermanent, something is suffering and something is non-self. And the characteristic of impermanence or the mark of impermanence is the mode of rise and fall and change. So if you want to know whether a given mind or matter is impermanent or not, you find out whether it has rising and then falling away, whether it changes or not. If you find that there are rise and fall and change, then you know it is impermanent. And in the commentaries it is explained as non-existence after having come to be. It is a book language. So non-existence after having come to be real simply means disappearing after appearing. So here disappearing is important. Disappearing after appearing. If you see only the appearing, if you see only the rising, you may not know that it is impermanent. You may even take it as permanent because you just see the beginning or you just see the, the arising. So it is important to see the disappearance or to see the fall so that you know this is impermanence. So the mark of impermanence is disappearance after appearance. First there is nothing. Then there arises some state. And then immediately it disappears. So first nothing, then arising and staying for some time, and then disappearing. So when you see the disappearing along with the arising, you know that this thing is impermanent. So the mark of impermanence is non-existence after having come to be. The second one, Dukkha Lakana, the characteristic of suffering is the mode of being continuously oppressed by rise and fall. Now it is important that you understand this characteristic of being suffering because although the word suffering is used we don't mean just pain. So when we hear the word suffering or when we see the word suffering we always think that it is some pain or painfulness. But yes, pain or painfulness is suffering but the word suffering or the word dukkha means more than that. So what is the characteristic of suffering? By what mark do we know that something is dukkha or suffering. So here the characteristics of suffering is given as the mode of being continuously oppressed by rise and fall. That means the states appear and disappear, appear and disappear, appear, appear and disappear. So when you see things appearing and disappearing continuously then you come to the conclusion that this is oppressed by rising and falling. That oppression by rising and falling is what we call dukkha or suffering. When you know this you can accept the Buddha saying that all five aggregates of clinging are suffering because among the five aggregates of clinging there are what we call happiness there are feeling of a pleasant feeling and there are unpleasant feeling and neutral feeling also but according to this characteristic what we call pleasures have a beginning and an end. They come and they go. They do not last forever. So they are said to be oppressed by rise and fall. One criterion Buddha gave was whatever is 
impermanent is suffering. So if you want to know whether something is suffering or not, find out whether it is impermanent or not. And if you want to know whether something is impermanent or not, find out whether it is arising and disappearing, whether it rises and then disappears. If you see the arising and disappearing of something, then you know that that thing is impermanent. And whatever is impermanent is, according to the criterion given by the Buddha, suffering. So suffering here means continuously oppressed by rise and fall. Now, rising and falling occur at every moment. Mental states arise and disappear in very rapid succession. And the material properties also rise and disappear in rapid succession, but not as fast as mental states. So this arising and disappearing occur at every moment. There is no moment when there are no rising and falling. The rising and falling is continuous. Rising followed by falling and falling followed by rising, rising followed by falling and so on. So this continuous oppression by rise and fall is the characteristic of dukkha or suffering. And then the characteristic of non-self is the mode of being insusceptible to the exercise of mastery. That means we cannot have control over them. So mind and matter they arise and they disappear on their own accord and we have no control over them. We cannot make them stay f longer than they normally stay. Uh, we cannot give orders to them not to arise or not to disappear and so on. So we have no exercise of authority over them. So that is one meaning of the characteristic of non-self. The fact that one cannot exercise complete control over the phenomena of mind and matter, that is the meaning of that. Another meaning of non-self is that there is no inner core, there is no substance. They arise and they just disappear and they are just arising and disappearing of a mental state and the material properties all the elements. So there is no abiding entity found in mind and matter. There is no self or no soul that lasts forever. The characteristic of non-self is having no authority over it or it having no inner core or insubstantial. So these are the three characteristics and they are called the common or general characteristics of all conditioned phenomena. And then there is another characteristic of the states, both mental and physical, and that is the individual characteristics. So there are two characteristics we must understand. Individual characteristic and general characteristic. All mental states have the individual characteristic of bending towards the object. So this is the characteristic of mind or mental states. If it is a mental state, it bends or it inclines towards the object. So bending or inclining towards the object is the individual characteristic of mind. Only mind has this characteristic and not matter. And this mind has the characteristic of impermanence, suffering and non-self. And uh, these three characteristics are called the general or common characteristics. Not only is mind impermanent, suffering and non-self, but also 
matter. So we need to understand and we need to see both kinds of characteristics when we practice vipassana meditation. First, we see the individual characteristics of mind and matter or material states and mental states. And then we see the common or general characteristics of them as impermanent, suffering and non-self. This is very important that when we practice vipassana meditation, we see these three characteristics and we see them from our own observation, from our own experience and not by recitation. Uh, you may be saying impermanent, 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 but if you do not really keep your mind on the object and really see it, it is like repeating something you have learned by heart. So here the understanding means through one's own experience, through observation. And next there are three contemplations and they are contemplation of impermanence, contemplation of suffering and contemplation of non-self. That means also uh, the word anupasana, the Pali word is anicca anupasana, so there is a word anupasana. So anupasana means repeated seeing, uh, repeated observing. So anicca anupasana really means repeated seeing of impermanence repeated seeing of suffering and repeated seeing of non-self. The manual will say something about these later. And then the ten insight knowledges. So when a yogi practices vipassana meditation, he has to go through the seven stages of purity. And in the seven stages of purity are included the ten insights knowledges and they are here the first one knowledge of comprehension knowledge of the understanding of mind and matter and so on so knowledge of understanding of mind and matter knowledge of the three characteristics of uh, mind and matter or all conditioned phenomena and then there is knowledge of rise and fall of formations so at this stage, the yogi sees the rising and falling of the phenomena, rising and falling of mind, rising and falling of matter. And then the next one is knowledge of dissolution of formations. So at this stage, the yogi sees only the fall, only the dissolution and not the arising. And next stage is knowledge of dissolving things as fearful. Now at this stage a yogi sees the formations of mind and matter as fearful because they are arising and disappearing at every moment because they are dissolving at any moment they are frightful or they are fearful. So a yogi sees them as fearful. Now when a yogi sees them as fearful he just sees them as fearful and he is not afraid. If he is afraid, then he is out of meditation. So although he sees that it is fearful, he is not afraid of it. And then next one is knowledge of fearful things as dangerous or as faulty. So after seeing that it is fearful, now you see false in mind and matter. So that seeing false in mind and matter is here called uh, knowledge of things as dangerous. And then the next one is knowledge of disenchantment with all formations. So when you see something disappearing and fearful and faulty, then you don't want them. There is disenchantment for these objects or for mind and matter. Sometimes it is translated as turning away. So turning away from the object. You are not attached to the object. You want to turn away from the object. So that is called disenchantment. And then the knowledge of desire for deliverance. After the knowledge of disenchantment, that means you don't want it now, then 
there is a desire for deliverance that means you want to get away from it or you want to throw it away so that is knowledge of desire for deliverance and then knowledge of reflecting contemplation actually it is re-reflecting to reflecting again and then knowledge of equanimity towards formation so at this stage the practice is effortless you don't have to make effort to be mindful you don't have to make effort to get concentration so they come as though uh, out of their own will and number 10 the last one is knowledge of conformity so we'll come to the knowledge of conformity later so these are the 10 insight knowledges but before a yogi reaches the first knowledge knowledge of comprehension he must go through two stages of knowledge defining mind and matter and discerning the conditions or causes of mind and matter so these two are not included here but in the commentaries these two are also called vipassana knowledge so vipassana knowledge can be 10 or more but according to this manual there are 10 vipassana knowledges or insight knowledges it is probably because when we take the word vipassana literally it means seeing three characteristics so that means only when you see the three characteristics do you practice vipassana but you will not see the three characteristics as soon as you sit down and practice meditation so in order to reach the stage of seeing the three characteristics you need to go through two stages of knowledge and the first stage is defining mind and matter that means seeing mind and matter clearly mind clearly matter clearly mind and matter clearly and defining this is mind this is uh, matter and so on and another stage is seeing the causes or conditions of mind and matter so we'll come to that later too so these two are not included in the 10 insight knowledges here because during these two stages a yogi does not see the three characteristics yet only when he reaches the knowledge of comprehension does he see the three characteristics and so he is said to be practicing vipassana meditation and then next is the three emancipations these are the void emancipation signless emancipation and desireless emancipation so we'll know more about them later and then the three doors of emancipation they are contemplation of the void the doors means actually means the means of emancipation so they are contemplation of the void contemplation of the signless and contemplation of the desireless also we'll come to them later now a little in detail now the first purification what is the first purification it is a purification of virtue purification of sila so here on page 347 purification of virtue is explained as it consists of the four kinds of purified virtue namely one virtue regarding restraint according to the party mokha two virtue regarding restraint of the sense faculties three virtue consisting in purity of livelihood and for virtue connected with the use of requisites now these are for monks 
So again, this manual also is written by a monk for monks. <laughs> so, virtue regarding restraint according to the body mokha. On page 348, there is an explanation. The body mokha is the code of fundamental disciplinary rules binding upon a Buddhist monk. That means the disciplinary rules a Buddhist monk is expected to keep. This code consists of 227 rules of varying degrees of gravity. So some are more grave and some are less grave and so on. Perfect adherence to the rules laid down in the party mokha. That code which consists of 227 rules is called party mokha. Today is the full moon day. So monks on full moon days and new moon days, monks have to observe Uposatha. And when they observe Uposatha, they listen to the Bhadimokha rules. So all monks would assemble at a place in a sima, a consecrated place, and one monk would recite the Bhadimokha rules and other monks must pay attention and listen to the rules. Because at the time when there were no books or no books are easily available, it is helpful for monks to remember the rules every fortnight, listening to the chanting of the Pantimokha. Since today is the full moon day, uh, we went to a Uposatha ceremony held at the Burmese uh, Buddhist temple. So, these are the rules. And perfect adherence to the rules laid down in the Bhatimokha is called virtue regarding restraint according to the Bhatimokha. That means, before practicing meditation, a monk must keep all these precepts. He must not have broken any of the precepts. That is what is meant by perfect adherence to the rules. Keeping the rules so that he does not break any of the rules. And if he has broken any of the rules, then he must do some amendments. The second is virtue regarding restraint of the sense faculties. Now the eyes, ears, nose, tongue and body are called senses. There are six senses in Buddhism, not just five. The usual five senses plus mind. So mind is called the sixth sense in Abhidhamma and in the teachings of the Buddha. So here, virtue regarding restraint of the sense faculties means the exercise of mindfulness in one's encounter with sense objects. That means when a monk sees something, hears something and so on, he must exercise mindfulness, he must practice mindfulness, he must be mindful. Not allowing the mind to come under the sway of attraction towards pleasant objects and repulsion towards unpleasant objects. So whether he encounters with a pleasant object or an unpleasant object, he must stay calm and impartial. He must not have attachment to the pleasant object and he must not have anger or aversion to the unpleasant object. So controlling one senses so that one does not get unwholesome states regarding pleasant objects or unpleasant objects is what is meant by this virtue regarding restraint of the sense faculties. That means avoiding unwholesome states from arising regarding the sense objects. Some sense objects are pleasant and some are unpleasant. Whether a monk encounters a pleasant object or unpleasant object, he must try to avoid like or dislike. He must try to avoid attachment or aversion 
towards these objects and he accomplishes it by practice of mindfulness. So restraint of the sense faculties does not mean keeping the eyes closed or keeping the ears closed because maybe it is possible to keep the eyes closed and ears closed but how about nose? <laughs> you cannot keep it closed and the tongue and the body. So actually restraint of the sense faculties means uh, practicing mindfulness so that you avoid unwholesome states from arising regarding these uh, sense objects. And the third is virtue consisting in purity of livelihood. It deals with the manner in which a bhikkhu acquires the necessities of life. Now there are four kinds of requisites uh, for monks, clothing, food, dwelling place and medicine and they are called requisites or necessities of life because they are necessary for life because without these four we cannot survive. Now purity of livelihood means a bhikkhu must acquire these necessities of life lawfully according to the laws or rules laid down by the Buddha. So that means a monk must acquire the necessities for example food by going on arms round. He should not acquire his requisites in a manner unbecoming for a monk who is dedicated to purity and honesty. So he must not acquire, he must not try to acquire the requisites in an unbecoming manner, unsuitable manner. That means he must not tell fortune, <laughs> he must not treat diseases of lay people and so on. So trying to get things through these practices is called improper way of acquiring the requisites. So monks are actually forbidden to tell fortune or to treat people with medicine and so on. They are called improper search. And the last one is connected with the use of the requisites. Again for monks, means that the bhikkhu should use the four requisites, robes, arms, food, lodging and medicines after reflecting upon their proper purpose. So when a monk wears the robe, he must reflect on the robe like as I use this robe just for protection against cold, against heat, against bites of mosquitoes, crawling insects and so on. And also I use the robes just to uh, cover myself properly and so on. So that means I use this robe not to take pride in the robes, not to pr take pride in myself, not to get arrogance regarding the robes and so on. So monks are expected to do this reflection whenever they make use of these four requisites. When they put on the robes, when they eat, and when they use the dwelling place entering and going out of the dwelling place, they must make this reflection. Since monks have to make reflections while they eat, the talking while eating is discouraged among monks. It is actually a bad behavior of monks say, to talk while they eat. These four are called four kinds of silas for monks. And when a monk is pure uh, with regard to these four kinds of silas, he is said to have achieved the purity of sila. The first one, the purity of virtue. Now the second one, purity of mind. Purity of mind consists of two kinds of concentration, namely excess concentration and absorption concentration. 
Here, two kinds of samadhi, two kinds of concentrations are mentioned. The first one is excess concentration. Now, the Pali word for it is upachara samadhi. Upachara means neighborhood. That means in the neighborhood of absorption or in the neighborhood of jhana. The other one is absorption concentration, jhana concentration and maga concentration. These two are said to be purification of mind. So if you want to achieve purification of mind, according to this statement, you must practice samatha meditation and get first excess concentration and then later absorption concentration. This statement is not only found in this manual but also found in many commentaries. So when they define the purification of mind, they almost always say purification of mind consists of excess concentration and absorption concentration or sometimes they may use the other expressions but meaning the same thing. They may use the purification of mind means the eight attainments together with excess concentration. So they mean the same thing. In order to achieve purification of mind according to this statement, you have to practice samatha meditation and get at least excess concentration. Or you can practice until you get absorption concentration. But what about those who do not practice samatha meditation, who practice vipassana only? In one commentary, it is said that purification of mind consists of excess concentration and absorption concentration for those whose vehicle is samatha. For those whose vehicle is vipassana, purification of mind means excess concentration or if there is no excess concentration then momentary concentration. That commentary is the only commentary where I found the mention of the momentary concentration as purification of mind. So according to that commentary, purification of mind means excess concentration, absorption concentration and momentary concentration. Now this is important because there are people who think that since it is stated here that purification of mind means excess concentration and absorption concentration, you must practice samatha meditation first and get the excess concentration and absorption concentration before you can practice vipassana meditation. So, you cannot practice vipassana meditation without attaining excess concentration or absorption concentration because when you practice vipassana meditation you have to go through these seven stages of purity. So if you do not have excess concentration, if you do not have absorption concentration, how can there be purification of mind? If there is no purification of mind, then the next one cannot follow, the purification of view and so on. So there are people who think that you must practice samatha meditation and attain at least excess concentration if you want to practice vipassana meditation. But according to that one commentary which states that the momentary concentration is also the purification of mind, then you don't need to practice 
Samatha meditation and get excess concentration or absorption concentration to achieve purification of mind. If you get the momentary concentration, then that momentary concentration is the purification of mind. Now the explanation given for this is very good and so let us read that explanation. The Pali Buddhist tradition recognizes two different approaches to the development of insight. One approach called the vehicle of calm, samatha involves the prior development of calm meditation to the level of excess concentration or absorption concentration as a basis for developing insight. Now there are two kinds of practitioners. The first one is one who has samatha as a vehicle. That means that person practices samatha meditation first and he gains excess concentration and absorption concentration. Then he takes the excess concentration or absorption concentration as the object of his vipassana meditation. So from that time on uh, his practice is vipassana. Such a person is called a person who has samatha as a vehicle. So having samatha as a vehicle does not mean that he practices samatha meditation only. He practices samatha meditation first and then he practices vipassana meditation based on the excess concentration or the absorption concentration he gains through the practice of samatha meditation. Now there is another type of practitioner of meditation and that person is called a person who has vipassana as the vehicle. Vehicle means a vehicle to reach Nibbana, to go to Nibbana. Now that person does not practice samatha meditation at all. Since he does not practice samatha meditation, he does not get excess concentration, he does not get absorption concentration. Then what kind of concentration does he get? he gets the momentary concentration. So momentary concentration is very similar to excess concentration. Oh, let me read the explanation. One approach called the vehicle of calm samatayana involves the prior development of calm meditation to the level of excess concentration or absorption concentration as a basis for developing insight. One who adopts this approach, the samatha yanika meditator, first attains excess concentration or one of the fine material or immaterial sphere jhanas. Then he turns to the development of insight by defining the mental and physical phenomena occurring in the jhana as mentality, materiality and seeking their conditions, after which he contemplates these factors in terms of the three characteristics. So he first tries to get excess concentration or absorption concentration by the practice of samatha meditation. And then he takes the excess concentration or absorption concentration as the object and he practices vipassana on these concentrations. So when he practices vipassana, he first defines the mental and physical phenomena in the jhana or in the excess concentration and then he finds the conditions for them and then he tries to see the three characteristics. For this meditator, his prior attainment of excess or absorption concentration is reckoned as his purification of mind. So for such a practitioner, the attainment of excess concentration and or absorption concentration is called his purification of mind. The other approach called the vehicle of pure insight, Suddha Vipassana Yana, 
does not imply the development of calm as a foundation for developing insight. So the second type of practitioner does not practice samatha meditation at all. Instead, the meditator, after purifying his morality sila, enters directly into the mindful contemplation of the changing mental and material processes in his own experience. That means, after purifying the morality, a person practices vipassana, say, on breathing in and out, on the rising and falling of the abdomen, or on any object which is prominent at the moment. As this contemplation gains in strength and precision, the mind becomes naturally concentrated upon the ever-changing stream of experience, with a degree of concentration equal to that of excess concentration. So, a person who practices meditation on mind and matter, on the object that becomes prominent at the moment, he gains what is called momentary concentration. Now, momentary concentration is concentration just for a moment and then it disappears, but it is replaced by another uh, concentration, another concentration and so on, and so it gains momentum and it becomes strong. So it becomes as strong as the excess concentration in Samatha meditation. This moment-by-moment moment fixing of the mind on the material and mental processes in their present immediacy is known as momentary concentration or in Pali, Kanika Samadhi. Because it involves a degree of mental stabilization equal to that of excess concentration, this momentary concentration is reckoned as purification of mind for the Vipassana Yanika Meditata. For a meditator who has vipassana only as the vehicle, the meditator who adopts the vehicle of pure insight. Such a meditator is called a dry insight worker. In Bali, sukha vipassaka, because he develops insight without the moisture of the jhanas. So there are two kinds of practitioners. One practices both samatha and vipassana, and the other practices vipassana only. The vipassana only practitioner practices vipassana on the objects, or on mind and meta, or on the five aggregates. Now, in the books, it is stated that he tries to see the three characteristics of the say, mind and meta, or of the objects. But actually, in the beginning, he does not see the three characteristics yet. He just tries to keep your mind on the object. He tries to get concentration. So there is a kind of samatha here, not really a samatha, but the concentration is essential. Without concentration, you cannot see the objects clearly and you cannot see the true nature of things. Since concentration is necessary and since the dry vipassana practitioner does not have excess concentration or absorption concentration, his concentration is called momentary concentration. So that momentary concentration is for a samatha yanika meditata, the purity of mind. Please note this carefully, because there are people who want to say, if you do not practice uh, samatha meditation and get, get the excess concentration or absorption concentration, you cannot practice vipassana, because you cannot have a purification of mind. But that is not true. You can get purification of mind without the practice of samatha meditation. And that purification of mind is here called 
momentary concentration. So that momentary concentration is important and in one sub-commentary it is said there can be no vipassana without momentary concentration. So when you practice vipassana meditation you need to gain momentary concentration. And momentary concentration is said to be gained when your mind is on the object almost all the time and there are very few wanderings of mind and also you are able to be mindful or you are able to catch it as soon as it goes out as soon as the mind goes out. So when you are able to be on the object and when there are wanderings also you can catch it right away then you are said to have gained the momentary concentration. Now momentary concentration in vipassana and excess concentration or absorption concentration in samatha between them there is difference. Now, excess concentration or absorption concentration takes only one object. As you learned yesterday, let's say, the counterpart sign. So, the object of excess concentration is counterpart sign and only that and none other. And the object of absorption concentration is also that uh, counterpart sign. So, there is only one object for excess concentration and absorption concentration. But for momentary concentration, there are m- many objects. At every moment, the objects may be different. Now, suppose you are concentrating on the breath here as the air element. So the air element is the object of your meditation and suppose you are able to keep your mind just on the air element. Then you hear a noise. Now when you hear a noise you have to be mindful of that noise. That means you have to take that noise as the object. So you change to the that object and make notes as hearing, hearing, hearing. Then that disappears. So when the noise disappears you go back to the breath. Ah. So there is different object at different moment. After you go back, there may be pain in your body and then your mind turns to pain. And so, for momentary concentration, there are many objects. Many objects means one at a time. But for excess concentration and absorption concentration, there is only one object. That is the difference between these two kinds of concentration, excess concentration and absorption concentration on the one hand and momentary concentration on the other. So regarding momentary concentration, there should be concentration always, let us say, on this side and the objects on this side may be different. So concentration of object A, uh, concentration on object B, concentration on object C, so objects may differ say A, B, C, D and so on, but there should always be concentration, concentration, concentration on this side. So when your mind can be on the meditation object and there are very few wanderings of mind and you are able to catch the wandering as soon as it occurs, then you are said to have momentary concentration. After you gain momentary concentration, you begin to see the object clearly. Before you gain momentary concentration, your observation is not clear because it is interfered with by what are called mental hindrances. So when you gain momentary concentration, as in the gaining excess concentration and absorption concentration, the mental hindrances are subdued. So they settled down as it were and so your mind becomes clear. So, for a vipassana yanika, or for a person who does not practice uh, samatha meditation but practice vipassana only, excess concentration is what is called purification of mind. 
So in the practice of vipassana nowadays, especially in the tradition of Mahasi Siyaro, there is momentary concentration. So this momentary concentration serves as purification of mind and so you cannot say that there is no purification of mind in this method. Next is purification of view. Purification of view consists in discernment of mind and matter with respect to their characteristics, functions, manifestations and proximate causes. Purification of view is so called because it helps to purify one of the wrong view of a permanent self. So when a yogi comes to this stage, he is able to get rid of the wrong view of a permanent self. This purification is arrived at in the course of meditation by discerning the personality as a compound of mental and material factors, which occur interdependently without any controlling self within or behind them. This stage is also called the analytical knowledge of mind and matter. So at this stage you are able to, to define mind and matter separately and this is mind, this is matter, this is mind and matter and so on. Because the mental and material phenomena are distinguished by way of their characteristics and so on. So a yogi is supposed to or expected to see the characteristics, function, manifestation and also approximate cause of the objects he keeps his mind on. Now characteristic means its mark, its individual essence. A function means it work and manifestation means the manifestation of it to a yogi. Now when a yogi, when a meditator concentrates on some state, that state manifests itself to his mind as this or that. And then the proximate cause. Proximate cause may or may not be discerned by everybody. Now if you want to understand these, because they are not explained here, because they are explained far back in the first chapter on page 29. Understanding of these uh, characteristic function manifestation is explained by Mahasi Syaro with the simile of looking at the lightning. Suppose you are looking at the sky there is a rainstorm and then lightning flashes. How long is the duration of lightning? Less than a second. But if you are looking at the sky when the lightning flashes, you see the lightning. I will ask you, what is the characteristic of lightning? What is its function? What is its manifestation? You may say, I don't know, but I saw the lightning very clearly. So when there is lightning, there is light. Now giving light is the characteristic of lightning. And when there is light, there is no darkness. So dispelling of darkness is the function of lightning. And the shape. Now, it is like the shape of uh, a crooked line or shape of a uh, root of a tree and so on. So that is the manifestation of the lightning. So at least these three things you see at once. You are looking at the sky and there was lightning and then you see all three at once. In the same way a yogi when contemplating or practicing mindfulness on the objects, he sees all these things. He may not be able to say this is characteristic and this is function and this is manifestation just as a person who saw the lightning may not be able to say this is the characteristic of lightning, this is a function and so on. But he sees all at once 
in a very brief moment, even in a fraction of a second, he sees all these three things. So in the same way, when you pay attention to the object, then you will not fail to see this also. So at this stage, when a yogi dwells on the object, he is able to distinguish mind from matter or matter from mind or uh, mental state from uh, material state and material state from mental state. And he also knows that the mind, as it were, goes to the object, bends towards the object. So whatever uh, bends towards the object is mind. And then when he takes matter as object, he knows that it has no cognitive power, it does not know anything. So that is one way of understanding the manifestation of matter. Sometimes you feel heaviness. So that is also a manifestation of matter. So when a yogi pays close attention to the object, he will not fail to see characteristic function and manifestation of that object. When a yogi sees that whatever object he keeps his mind on, he sees that it is mind, it is matter, and also he knows that there is the mind which is aware of the objects. So there are two things going on at every moment. The object which is, let us say, noted and the noting mind. So that is at that moment. You stop meditating and go back to daily activities and you may get that notion again. But when you are observing the objects in your practice, you are able to at least put this wrong view away from you uh, for some moments. So that is why it is called purification of view understanding the characteristic function manifestation and proximate causes of mind and matter is called the purification of view. After that stage, the next stage is purification by overcoming doubt. Purification by overcoming doubt is the discernment of the conditions of that same mind and matter. So at this stage, a yogi discerns or sees the conditions or the causes of the mind and matter uh, he is trying to be mindful of. So purification by overcoming doubt is so called because it develops the knowledge which removes doubts about the conditions for mind and matter during the three periods of time, past, present and future. So regarding the past or the present or future, he is able to remove the doubt. So doubt means indecision, not wrong view. Doubt is indecision. You're going to make a decision. You are at a crossroads and you don't know which to take. If you know which one to take, then you are not in doubt. You may take a wrong road, but you are not in doubt. So when you are in doubt, you cannot decide which is which. So with regard to mind and matter you are observing, since you are observing and you are experiencing them, you know that they are true, they are real. And you have no doubt about whether they existed in the past, whether they will exist in the future. You know that they existed in the past and they will exist in the future and they exist right now. So with regard to uh, mind and matter, you are able to remove uh, doubts. The knowledge which removes doubts about the conditions for mind and matter during the three periods of time, it is achieved by applying during the contemplative process one's knowledge of dependent arising in order to understand that the present compound of mind and matter has not arisen by chance or through a hypothetical cause such as a creator god or primordial soul but has come into being from previous ignorance craving clinging and karma and that is where the knowledge of dependent origination comes in 
So that is why dependent origination is taught in the eighth chapter in preparation for the practice of vipassana meditation. So when you know the dependent origination, you know that mind and matter here in this life is conditioned by or caused by ignorance, craving, clinging and karma in the previous lives. So you discern them that the mind and matter in the present life are caused by or conditioned by ignorance, craving, clinging and karma in the past. So when you see this, you know that there was a life in the past and now there is life here and just as there was a life in the past and life here, so there will be life in the future. So you are able to remove doubt about whether the past exists or not, whether the future will exist or not. You definitely know that the past existed before and now it is the present and then the future will come. So you are able to remove doubt at this stage of discerning the conditions of mind and matter or conditions of the five aggregates of clinging or conditions of conditioned phenomena. One then applies this same principle to the past and future as well. This stage is called the knowledge of discerning conditions. So this is also called in Pali Pachaya Parigaha Jnana. When a person, a yogi has reached this stage and is able to remove doubts, he is called a lesser sotapanna. He is called a chula sotapanna. He is called a chula sotapanna because he resembles the real sotapanna by having next, at least next rebirth uh, fixed for him. Now, a sotapanna, a real sotapanna, will not be reborn in the four woeful states. So a sotapanna will be reborn as a human being or as a celestial being, but never in hell or as an animal and so on. Chula sotapanna, a lesser sotapanna, is said to have fixity in his next rebirth. So for his next rebirth, he is sure that he will not be reborn in the four woeful states. That is, if he does not fall away from that stage, he may reach that stage one day and then he gave up meditation and then he lost that stage, then his rebirth is not assured. But if he practices meditation, he reaches that stage and he can stay in that stage and he uh, with practice and with that he dies, then his rebirth is assured. That means he will not be reborn in the four woeful states, but will be reborn in the blissful states such as human beings and celestial beings. So, it is very worth practicing vipassana meditation. Now, you have not entered into the vipassana proper. Huh? At this stage, you are not in Vipassana yet. You have not seen the three characteristics. What you have seen is, this is mind, this is matter, and then there are conditions for this mind and matter, just that. By just seeing that, you are said to have become a Chula Sotapanna, not, not a real Sotapanna, <laughs> a lesser Sotapanna, and your next rebirth is assured. So you will not be reborn in hell and so on. Even before you enter the proper domain of vipassana, you are assured of uh, your rebirth. So we should uh, practice vipassana with diligence. Because if we have reached at least this stage, then we can uh, rest assured that our next rebirth will be a good one. Okay.
Let's have a break. <laughs> 